Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord around the world. Skin and bones. Skin and bones. If I can draw your attention to verse 1, Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel says, Yeah, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Had he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, had he set me in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones, had he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry, and he asked me, Son of man, can these dead bones live? This encounter starts with the prophet saying that the hand of the Lord was upon me. Anybody looking for God's hand? I've been asking this almost every Sunday for the last month. Anybody looking for God's hand? When I was younger, we used to sing a song in the old church that said, you better hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. You better hold to his hand. I'm not going to try to sing. God's unchanging hand. Build your hope on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand, the hand of the Lord, the in, intention of God, the intervention of God, God's hand. He says, God's hand was on me. Not just the sight of God, not just the face of God, the hand of God. Anybody looking for it? Not just his attention, but his hand. Not just his voice but his hand. Not just a thought from God, but his hand. Not just his eye on the sparrow, his hand. He said his hand was upon me. His, the hand of the Lord was upon me. The other day, uh, one of my goddaughter was, was, was with me. She was out at the house, and she's almost three. And so she was there, and we were in the backyard, and I... She was about to trip, and I, I reached out, and I said to her, take my hand. Take my hand. I said it as a command. I didn't say it as a request. I said, take my hand. Reached it out. I said, take my hand. And she, she grabbed my hand. When she first took my hand, I said, give me your hand. She looked at me. I said, give me your hand. She gave me her hand. The reason why I said give me your hand was because she was about to trip and fall into the pond. And I said to her, give me your hand. And it, when I said give me your hand, and when God says give me your hand, number one, it's a helping hand. I helped her up. I, I grabbed her. I pulled her up. She was about to fall in the pond. I grabbed her and I helped her. Anybody looking for a helping hand? Anybody saying, God, God, I want your hand to help me. Lord, I need help. Jesus is my help. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I, I need to hold to your hand. I need the hand of the Lord to be upon me. And God is saying, okay, well, give me your hand. And that, that hand is a helping hand. That hand is a hand that will grab me and help me to get up. Later, she was running, and she fell down, and she skinned her. She, she didn't skin her knee, but she just had a little something on it, and she's crying. And I said, come to, she came to me. I said, give me your hand. She came over. I pulled her close, and I just rubbed the spot on her knee because sometimes we need a healing hand. I just rubbed her little bruise, and I just, I knocked the dust off, and, and I said, there you go. It's going to be better. It's okay. And, and I rubbed her, her bruise, and she felt better because sometimes the hand is a healing hand. <laughs> then the third time I said to her, give me your hand, was because it was time to go in the house. I said, give me your hand because it was a leading hand. It was it was a, a heavy hand, a heavy hand. I don't know if any of you can remember that heavy hand. <laughs> I, I remember the heavy hand. I remember the hand upon me holding me steady. I can remember being fidgety and being little and couldn't sit still. And my daddy just laying his hands on me pulling me to him, to the front of his legs, just pulling me back and just not squeezing me, but just the heaviness of his hand saying, be still, be still. He didn't even have to say be still. Just the weight of his hand. 
Just the heaviness of his hand. Oh my God, I need a witness this morning. I need a God. Just the weight of his hand. Just the heaviness of his hand. It wasn't a helping hand. It wasn't a healing hand. It was a heavy hand. It was a, I'm about to lead you hand. It was a, let me control you hand. It was, let me grab you. Let me settle you. It was a heavy hand. Any, I don't know if anybody got that, that heavy hand where, where your mama or your daddy said, give me your hand. And when you reached out your hands to them, they snatched you. I don't know if you've ever been. I don't know if you've ever been snatched. My God, I've been snatched. I've done some snatching where I said, give me your hand. And they reached out. I said, come here. And as they reached out to me, I, when, I, when they grabbed my hand, I jerked. I, I can remember my dad said, give me your hand. And as I gave my hand, he jerked me. And my body moved on its own. My neck snapped. I ended up having a neck brace. No, my neck got whiplash from him snatching me. I don't know if you've ever been snatched. <laughs> the word says that God sent his word and healed them and snatched them from the door of death. Sometimes God got to snatch you. <laughs> Sometimes God has to snatch you. Ezekiel here says, yeah, God snatched me. The hand of the Lord was upon me. Sometimes we want to hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand, and we just want a healing hand. We want a helping hand. We want to make a way hand. We want to open up the door hand. We want to heal my body hand. We want him to be the work my miracle hand. We want him to be to get these people out my face hand. We want him to talk to the hand. But when it comes time for the heavy hand of God, for that weighty hand, for that the weightiness and the and the depth and the strength and the power of God, the snatched hand, the hand that snatched you somewhere that you might not have wanted to go to. I need a witness. I don't know if any of you have ever been snatched someplace. Ezekiel is saying here, God snatched me. Anybody been snatched? God snatched me. God grabbed me and jerked. God picked me. God took me by my hand. He laid his hand on me and he led me somewhere that even maybe I didn't want to go. Ezekiel said, yeah, God snatched me. And sometimes the leading hand of God Leads you to dead places. I know when we think about him holding to my hand and leading me and guiding me, we think, oh, pasture's green and, yeah, and leading me in great places. But sometimes in the leading of God, he leads me to a place that makes me say, Lord, why did you lead me here? My God, Lord, why, why this place? This is a, Lord, I, I thought when you grabbed my hand and snatched me and led me by the hand of God, I thought you were going to lead me somewhere that would make me happy and lead me somewhere that would make me smile and lead me somewhere that would fill me full of joy. But Lord, you have led me into a valley of death. Sometimes God leads us to a place of death. I remember when I first came to Durham, my God, Durham, North Carolina. I know y'all are watching this morning around the world, but when I face, first came to the Raleigh-Durham area, when I flew into, into, the, into the airport and I got in the rental car, some guy prophesied to me there. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but someone met me there that the Lord had sent to prophesy to me, and, and I, I drove into downtown Durham. We talking about 2002, my God. We talking about 2000. We're not talking about the nice, wonderful downtown Durham that we got now. We talking about tumbleweeds. We we talking about ghosts. Woo! We talking we talking about 
dead and dry. I, I remember when I moved here and I went to some prayer meetings with some of the pastors from the area and they said, who are you? And I told them I moved here and from Oklahoma and they said, man, I can't believe you moved here. Nobody got no big church in Durham. This is a dead place. This is a dry place. I, that first day when I came, after I drove to downtown Durham, I got in the car. I drove up to Raleigh. When I drove through downtown Raleigh, I said, oh, hallelujah, Lord, look at Raleigh. This is where you want me to be. The Lord said, no, no, no. I want you to turn around and go back. I showed you Dur I showed you Raleigh so that I could confirm to you that I wanted you to start in Durham. Sometimes where the Lord leads you doesn't always look beautiful. It's not always pretty. It's not always full of life. Sometimes he brought you to the dead place to speak life to it. Sometimes God leads you. I, I know we're not interested in it, but sometimes in the leading of God, in the being obedient to God, in the walking with him, in the holding to his hand, he leads you somewhere, and you have to say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. God, I sure am glad you're with me, because you have led me through the valley of the shadow of death. Ezekiel, that's why I read that passage there in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk, the Lord is my shepherd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you're with me. Because sometimes if I'm walking with him, you could almost ask the writer, well, what are you doing walking through the valley of the shadow of death if he's with you, meaning you're with him? Well, it's because he led me there. Ezekiel said, yeah, the Lord. The Lord led me. He snatched me. He led me through a valley of the shadow of death. He led me through a tough place. He led me through a dry, dead valley. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. This moment, this COVID-19 pandemic crisis, this moment, this is a valley of death death my god this is a valley of death this is we're losing more folk than we ever thought we would lose and we still don't see any end in sight and and it's spiking again and we look this this is a moment in which hospitals are overrun we are in a moment now, and I, I'm not saying it's God's will. I'm just saying that we have been led by the hand, and many of us are walking through a moment that it was, if it was up to us, we wouldn't be here. Who am I talking to this morning? If it was up to us, this moment is a valley of death moment. My business, it's, there's challenges going on with it. It looks like it's a valley of the shadow of death. It looks like I am not going to come out of this. I don't know who I'm talking about. It looks like I may not make it. It looks like this marriage looks like it's over. This relationship looks like it's over. This business looks like it's over. This thing looks like it's over. Can I speak to you? Can I prophesy to you? It ain't over till God says it over, but it's over. But I, I, I know what it's like to hold to his hand and feel like, yeah, this is a valley of the shadow of death. If you're a black American, for all us, the black Christians that I that I preach to, I know not everybody's a black Christian, but in the, for the African Americans, this looks like a death moment. This looks like the valley of the shadow of death. This looks like a spot in which we are getting killed in the streets and, and our women are being doors kicked in and, and still no justice for Brianna Ted. Where This looks like a valley of the shadow of death. Lord, this is, we are holding to his hand and we have been led to a moment here in 2020. And here we are last Sunday in July of 2020. No end in sight to the pandemic. Trying to work on a vaccine. When are we going to be able to meet together? We're not sure. Can they have school? Can, can they go back? Will there be basketball? Will there be a football season? We're not sure. We're looking down a path and we don't know 
We're holding to, are we holding to his hand? I can make an argument that we haven't been holding to his hand, but maybe God's got our attention and we're holding to his hand. Ezekiel said, hey, the Lord laid his hand on me, heavy hand on me, and he led me to a valley of dry bones. led me to this place where it was dead and dry and instead of speaking to me, instead of encouraging me, instead of God saying, hey, look, it's going to be all right, instead of the Lord saying, hey, I led you here because I want you to see something, the first thing that God does with Ezekiel is he asks him a question. And his question is, can these dead bones live? This is an important question. I'm throwing it on the screens for you this morning. Can these dead bones live? It's a question for us today. Is resurrection even possible? We serve a God and we celebrate Easter. We weren't able to celebrate together this year. But the biggest day of the year is, is, is Easter. Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord. We, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. We, we are serving in a faith that has resurrection in it. And are scared of death. Can resurrection happen? My God. Can these dead bones live? The Lord brings Ezekiel up into the valley and says, hey, hey, son of man, can these dead bones live? I, I'm speaking that this morning. Hey, son of man. Hey, woman. What, uh, uh, my sister, my brother. Can your business live again? Can your relationship be restored? Can your marriage go? Can God turn your situation around? Can the thing that looks like it's dead live? Where is your faith? Do you believe God that he has resurrection power? The Lord, I, I could almost see Ezekiel saying, Lord, you don't want to put your hand on me. You don't want to lead me into this dead place. And now you want to ask me the question, can these dead bones live? It's a question for us. It's a question we're going to end up having to answer. Can our dead economy live? Can our dead companies live? Can our dead businesses live? Can we be, can we recover from this? I know we're not even interested in recovery. we mad that we even had to go through it. But maybe, just maybe, we learned something about resurrection power. And I'm asking somebody this morning, can God do anything but fail? God is saying, wait, wait, what am I? Who am I? That cannot do it. Can, can this dead thing live? God asks Ezekiel, Ezekiel. What do you believe? What do you think? Where's your faith? Can these dead bones live? I love Ezekiel's answer, although I would contend that there are several acceptable answers that he could have said. I've preached this before. I'm preaching it again. There are several acceptable answers that Ezekiel could have made when the Lord said, can these dead bones live? All kinds of answers that Ezekiel could have gave that in my estimation would have all been acceptable. They may not have been churchy sound and then they may not have made the story quite as good and we might not have liked it, but, but they would have been some acceptable answers. The first acceptable answer would have been no. <laughs> Can these dead bones live? No. You done led me into a valley of dry bones. You done made me walk up and down them. Not only are they dead, they're dry. This, this valley, this, that, this death happened a while ago. No. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes it's too late. Life teaches you that. Time teaches you that. Age teaches you that. I was shooting with my son, AJ, and I, I think I talked about this on Wednesday, but I was shooting on, well, on one of these past Wednesdays, but I was shooting with my son, AJ, and, and, and we, you know, we just, I was shooting, and I, I still can, I've got a little muscle memory, and I still can shoot just a little bit, but I, but, and at, when we got done shooting, he just said, Dad, I don't understand why you don't play, and I said, oh, oh, oh yeah, can these dead bones jump? No, they can't. Uh, can these dead knees? 
trees run? No, they can't. Uh, can Don't let the shooting fool you. Uh, I might be able to stand still and shoot. Uh, I might be able to stand still and see the goodness of the Lord, but don't make me run. Uh, don't make me jump. Uh, don't make me try to defend nobody. It's too late for that. He said, Dad, I just figured, man, do what you should come. I said, no, no, I can come and watch y'all play. When he run, it looks like a gazelle. It looked like a deer. When I run, it looked like a tractor digging up the mud. I said, son, it's too late for me. Can these dead bones ball? It's too late for that. Too late for that. My wife and I planning some kind of vacation. We're trying to go somewhere. We figure we're going to go somewhere. Somebody said something to me like, don't have no more kids. I said, ha, ha, ha. It's too late for that, buddy. Don't let this face fool you. It's, can, thou, can we have babies? No, it's too late. Stuff has been done. Stuff is gone gone. It's too late. There's something. My wife and I laughed when somebody said that to us. We said, you have no idea how old we really are. It's too late for that. Can these dead bones have a baby? No, they cannot. It's too late. Sometimes no is an acceptable answer. I was having a conversation with someone, and I was telling them back when I lived in Boston, I had this opportunity maybe to go to Harvard. Harvard had this one-year education. You can get your master's in education in one year. Folk were saying, Andy, you should apply. and Why don't you go there? And I, I was so caught up in ministry, and I, I just never did it. And somebody, I was telling the story, and somebody said to me, well, it's still happening. Why don't you do it now? I said, are you kidding? It's too late. for the, This brain don't work like a you. This this mind don't work like a, sometimes I can't remember my own points. My God, uh, sometimes I, I got enough trouble just writing sermons for y'all, uh, let alone writing a paper. This is a 51-2. This brain cannot get, it's too late. Can that dead brain study? Sir, no, it's too late. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes you have to take advantage of the opportunity when you could. I still think I could get my rap album done. It's too late for that. Somebody said to me, Pastor Andy, if you work hard enough, you can still get a six-pack. I said, six-pack? What you talking about? The only six-pack I got is a six-pack of prune juice so that I could go to the... <laughs> the only six-pack I... I got a six-pack of Ben Gay for my sword. I got a, a six-pack. I got a six-pack of Motrin. I got six, a, a six-pack. That's my six-pack. I got a six-pack a soda, a six-pack. It's too late for the six-pack. This, this is the fact. Listen, I live my, the fact that I can look down and see is the 50-year-olds. It's too late. PA, can you get your six-pack back? No. Don't show me the video. Don't show me the guy with his skin all tight. No. Can this six-pack live? No. No would have been an absolute acceptable answer. No. Another acceptable answer would have been, I don't know. <laughs> the Lord said to him, hey, Ezekiel, can these dead bones live? Ezekiel could have said, you know, I, I really don't know. That, to me, that would have been a very acceptable answer. Stop acting like you know everything. Stop. Part of the problem with the church, part of the problem with the Christian world, part of the problem, part of the reason why I don't nobody want to talk to us or listen to us is because we try to give an answer to everything. We try to give an explanation for everything. We try to think, and we try to act like we know everything. Sometimes you need to just say, I don't know. Stop acting like you know everything. 
only it was that easy. I saw some video a couple of weeks ago. My son showed me this. Man, he showed me some video of, of some, some church leaders and from somebody. They're going to slam a staff in the ground. They got a black lady and a white guy and a guy who's aged. They're going to slam some, some staff in the ground and declare racism in the churches. If only it was that easy. The hubris. To think that you can just speak it and declare it and it's over. It's Stop acting like you know all the answers. Sometimes you got to just say, I don't know. Why did that happen, Pastor Andy? I don't know. Why Kobe? I don't know. Why Breonna Taylor? I don't know. Why George Floyd? I don't know. I, I can give you some reasons. I can point at some stuff, but... Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. Why did they get taken and somebody else got the, I don't. Sometimes you just got to say, I don't know. Can these dead bones live? I don't know. Can this church be resurrected? I don't know. Can you get this land? I don't know. I've said it before. I, it's not in the notes. But I've said, it's amazing to me how sure the unsuccessful are and how unsure the successful will admit that they are. I'm amazed. Sometimes the people who are the most successful will admit to you, well, we're trying it, and I, I believe this is going to work, and I, I, I'm pretty sure this is going to happen, but we're going to try this out. We're going to dig it. We're going to dung it. We're going to see if it bears fruit. Sometimes the folk who talk the most confidence are the biggest losers, my God. Sometimes the people that supposedly have the most Holy Ghost really just have the most hubris. Think they God. It's amazing the stuff that I see. I, I, I scroll through Facebook and I see people doing all kinds of stuff, standing in their backyard rebuking the COVID storm. And I, I just think, my Lord and my God, the, the, the absolute audacity to think that you have the power and the authority to just speak at a storm. Don't think of yourself so highly. Sometimes you just have to admit you don't know. Why do the good die young? I don't know. Perfectly good answer is I don't know. Sometimes you just have to admit to yourself and to the people around you, I don't know. I, I'm telling you, you'll get a lot farther instead of faking and acting like you know. Sometimes you just don't know. I love Ezekiel's answer because Ezekiel's answer is, Lord, you know. <laughs> He didn't say no. He didn't say, I don't know. He said, Lord, you tell me. He said, Lord, you know. How about this, God? How about we stop acting like I got all the answers? How about we stop acting like my knowledge is so amazing? I know in part. I prophesy in part. It's, it's incredible to me how I'll have conversations with people and they will talk about prophecies they receive and prophecies that were given. They talk about those prophecies like they're some kind of absolutes. God was telling me, oh, well, my wife, my wife, she was in prayer, and then, and then the Lord spoke to her, and then she turned, and the Lord said to her, there's your husband, and then she turned around and saw me, and that's why we're together. I said, oh, really? Wow. So you are, you're, are you meaning to tell me that y'all are together over a word she got from God in the did you like each other? Did you? He was like, well, kind of. I said, well, kind of. How's it going now? He's like, well, it's not going very good. And we, we don't really talk. And we don't really kiss. And we don't really sleep in the same bed. And we don't. I said, well, it sounded to me like that wasn't God. We were raised by a bunch of folk who were so cocky about their their spiritual revelation. They went too far and they started thinking that they were the Holy Ghost and not just had the Holy Ghost. Oh, God. 
my Lord, I got to get back to my point. My point is, is Ezekiel says, Lord, you know, look, Lord, I'll tell you what, God, I'll do what you tell me to do because I'm in a place that's dead. I'm in a place that's dry. I'm in the valley of bones. I've never been in a situation like this one before. That's where I am. I'm saying, Lord, I've never been here before. My Lord, it's 1030. I'm saying, Lord, I've never been here before. I've never been in this situation before. Lord, you know, you tell me what to do. God's answer is prophesy. Skin and bones, prophesy. So I'll tell you what I, what I want you to do is I want you to prophesy. I, I want you to open up your mouth and prophesy. That's what I feel the Spirit of God telling me to do this morning is to prophesy. Say, speak to skin and bones. Come on the valley of dry bones and prophesy. And I love what God told Ezekiel to say to the valley. I'm going to say it this morning, and I'm going to be done. But the first thing that he said, he said, he said to me to say to them, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I will make breath into you, and you will come to life. The first thing that he's telling me to do and to prophesy to you is sense knowledge, wisdom. Don't just get up and just holler. Get up and make some sense. <laughs> get up and give some knowledge. Get up and speak some wisdom. Get up. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Stand here and prophesy to them and say to them, hear the word of the Lord. Don't just shout, hear the word of the Lord. Don't just holler, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> hear what God is saying. Get some sense. Get some knowledge. Get some wisdom. Get some perspective. Hear a word. Get into the word. Hear a word. Allow the word of God to transform your thinking. Get some sense prophesy and say to the bones, number one, bones, hear. Before he ever told bones to live, he told bones to hear. Before he ever said anything about breath, he said, hear, talking to dead bones and telling bones to hear because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm amazed at how I'll be talking to someone and encouraging them. And it's, this just happened a couple of weeks, just happened a week or so ago. I was talking to one of the faithful members in our church and, and, and just counsel, just helping, just having a conversation and called me and asked me and just, and I sat there and listened to them talk for 20, 30 minutes. And then I said to them, did you listen to the message last night? The message of, the message from Wednesday night directly apply to their situation and they said yeah I heard it and I said okay well all I'm going to do is preach it to you again <laughs> how can you not be shaken you need some powerful praying people around you it, it's very interesting that all you really need is to hear the word of the Lord God says I will do and you will know all through this, the Lord says, yeah, when I get done, I'm going to say this, and they're going to have a knowledge that they didn't have. They're going to know that I am the Lord. Man, I'm running out of time this morning. They're going to know that I am the Lord because that knowledge and that sense and that word and that wisdom, I'm supposed to prophesy to you, and I'm supposed to get you to hear the word of the Lord. He says in verse number uh, 9, he said, prophesy to them 
he, he said, speak to them. So in verse 7, he said, so I prophesied as I was commanded. That's what I'm doing. I'm prophesying as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and flesh and, and tendons appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them that I, I spoke as I was commanded. The second, second thing in the prophecy is, is first it's sense, and the second thing is speech. I prophesied as I was commanded. You have to prophesy as you're commanded. I, I, I spoke as I was commanded to speak. I don't know if you've ever been commanded to say something. Commanded to speak truth. Commanded to speak into the future. Commanded to encourage. Ezekiel speaks to the bones he, he says, hear the word, then he speaks to the situation. Prophesy to the bones, tell the bones, hear, tell the bones, speak. There's a speech that makes bones come together. There's a speech that will even make Dead things and dry things, things that look like they'll never come back together again. There's a speech that will make the dead stuff come together. In the prophecy, there's sense. In the prophecy, there's speech. And the speech you hear is the speech that will come out your mouth. I think I was talking about this a couple of Wednesday nights ago in which I was talking about mouth muscle memory and, and what have you trained your mouth to say and you you speak what you hear and and get in the word in your mouth because that I'm prophesying to dead bones and I'm saying dead bones hear the word of the Lord this is what I've been commanded to prophesy to you there's a speech there's a word and as as you hear that word, that word will come out your mouth. It said they came together and flesh, skin, and bones were together, but there was no life yet. And then in verse 9, he said, prophesy to the breath, prophesy to the wind, son of man. Say this, come breath from the four winds and breathe into the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. <laughs> What's the third thing he's commanding me to speak? The spirit. The wind is the spirit. The breath is the spirit. It's one thing for the bones to come together. Coming together is great, but where is the spirit? The structure is amazing, but where is the spirit? The principles are awesome. But where is the spirit? We have to be careful that in our structures, we don't forget to call in the spirit. We have to be careful in all of our nice buildings that we don't, we don't forget to ask the Holy Ghost to sweep through here. There's a whole lot of really great buildings that have been built bone on bone, tendon on tendon with no life in it. We have to be careful that we're not so caught up in the structure of the principle that we miss the life-giving spirit that actually makes the thing of army that actually can move. Coming together is great. The speech pulls the bones together, but without the spirit, there's no life. I've been asking God. The, the Lord said, yes, son, I want you to prophesy, and I want you to say to the wind, come on, from the four winds, come on, wind, come on, breathe on us, breath of God. Come on, Spirit of God, come back on us. Spirit of God, come back on our people. Spirit of God, come back on our churches. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Lord, we we don't want to be so cocky in our structure and in our plan and in our recipe and in our strategies that we miss the fact that we need the Holy Ghost to blow through here. 
It's great for the bones and the tendons to come together, but where is the spirit? The marching's great, but where's the spirit? Black Lives Matter, is that Black Lives Matter, that's awesome, but where's the spirit? <laughs> there better be some spirituality in it. There better be some prayer in there. There better be some holy. In all of this, we overcoming. We better get some Holy Ghost in this thing. Black Christians, we better get the spirit back. We have to ask God, where is your spirit? Lord, send your spirit on us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on this this morning. That's what I'm prophesying. Come, spirit of God, and breathe through this place. Breathe new life within us. Send your anointing on us. Verse 11, I'm done. Verse 11, he says, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. And they say our, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone and we're cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say to this is what the Lord says. I'm going to open your graves. <laughs> My God, I'm speaking this over somebody. I'm going to resurrect you. I'm going to open up your graves. And I'm going to bring you up from your grave. And I'll bring you back to your land. Back to your space. What is God telling Ezekiel to prophesy? He says, Ezekiel, when you get done prophesying sins and when you get done speaking and that speech happens, when the Spirit comes in, tell my people, you got to get some space. Put my spirit in you and you will live. I'll raise you up and resurrect you from out of your grave. And then I'm going to lead you to some land that's yours. I'm going to lead you to your own land. I'm going to lead you to your own property. I'm, going, I'm not going to just do something in the spirit spiritual and in the supernatural, but something in the supernatural will manifest itself in the natural. I speak that over us this morning. Land. I speak property over us in the name of Jesus. I speak ownership over. What's the point of all this Holy Ghost and it, you don't own nothing? I, I want the presence of the Spirit to create a power and a favor on us so that we own. He said, yeah, the Lord said, yeah, when I get done with you, you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to give you your own space. I'm going to give you your own land. You're going to have your own space. You're not going to be all crowded in. You're going to have your own space. You are going to have an area in which you can say, God, as a result of my prayer, God, as a result of the resurrection power, God, as a result of your spirit, as a result of the wisdom and the knowledge you gave me, as a result of what I started saying, as a result of you filling me full of your spirit, I got me some space. I got me some land. I got me a deal. I went and bought. I heard a yes when I should have heard a no. I put my trust in you, and God, I've never been put to shame, and you have blown my mind with the space you gave me. I speak to every skin and bones, and I say, dead bones come to life. Dead bones come together, a vast army. Dead bones be full of the Spirit. Dead bones, get your land, get your property, be an owner, not a renter, my God. Believe God for your own space. Can I get you to give off of that word right now? I, 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 I got to get you to give off of that. I, I prophesy that over you right now. I'm prophesying land over somebody. I'm prophesying home ownership over somebody. I'm prophesying space over somebody. It's what black Christians need. We, we need the Holy Ghost. We need sense. We need speech. We need the Holy Ghost. We, we've had the Holy Ghost. What we need now is space. 
We need space. We need our own spot. We need our own land. We, we got to stop paying other people's rent. We, we got to stop paying rent to other people and making other people rich. It is our time to walk in our own space. Last Sunday in July, I'm believing by this time next year, can I speak that over you? By this time next year, you will be in your own space. By this time next year, you will be the lender and not the... By this time next year, can I get you to sow into that? I want you to give. I, 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 you know, I've been taking up this second offering at the end of every service. I want you to give. And, and you could just text, woe online to 77977. My God, I feel the anointing of God in here. I want you to activate your faith this morning. I want you to give to the work of the kingdom of God. Come on, it's almost 11. I do this every single Sunday. It's quarter to 11. Uh, we got 1130 service about to happen. But before, before we end the service, can I get you to give? If you've never given before, so many of you, you're giving, you're giving faithfully. I took up the tithes this morning here in the 9 o'clock service. But I, I, I'm trying to get you to give to the work of the kingdom of God. I'm trying to get you to sow. And I'm, of course, I've got plans. And I, I'm looking at land. And I, I looked just last week. I went and looked at the land, and, and God's got something working in us. But what I'm really believing God for is that he'll bless you with your own first. Oh, hallelujah. I've been speaking this for the last several years. When last year when our theme was Canaan, I said, that's right. I want the Lord to bless you with your Canaan first so that when I ask you to give, we'll be ready to build the temple. Uh, I could talk about all of that. I could talk about the temple and talk about what we need to build, World Overcomers. And wherever you may be around the world, you, can, you remember with us now, and you can give to the work of the kingdom of God. But I'm trying to get you to sow into this prophetic prophetic word that I'm speaking over your life right now. Can you give in faith? Just text woe online to 77977. If you've never done it before, push pay will pop up. You'll have a one-time registration. You'll be able to sell. For all of you that give on the, on the regular, I've been asking for at least $50 in these second offerings. <laughs> and all of you that are world overcomers, world overcomers united globally, worldwide. <laughs> As we leave from this lease space to our own land that we own, I'm going to be asking you to give. But right now, I'm just trying to get you to sow into this word you heard. Say, Pastor Andy, I believe. I'm going to own my own land. By this time next year, I'm going to own my own property. By this time next year, I'm going to own my own house. It's going to be worth something. It's going to be worth more than I owe on it. I'm not going to be upside down. I'm going to get a house. I'm going to have some equity. Even if I have a mortgage, I'm going to have equity. Believe in God, I'll have my own. Can I get you to sow on that real quick? Can I get you to give to the work of the kingdom? I'm not going to beg you. I'm giving you an opportunity to exercise faith. And I'm running out of time. We've got another service that's going to start in just a little bit. So let me pray for you. God, I pray for every person that has faith. I pray for every person that heard this word. I pray for every person that feels like they are in the valley. They are the dry bones. They are at the end of their rope. They feel they're at the end of their faith. They feel that they're at the end of their strength. God, be our strength. Father, light the way. Be our present help. Be God in our situation. As we give, as we sow, God, I pray that you'll revive us again. I pray, God, that you'll revive our faith and revive our trust. It's so sweet to trust you. God, I pray that you'll revive the hope in us. We say we're your people and we feel like we're cut off and our hope is dried up. But, God, I pray that you'd restore our hope and restore our faith. Fill us full of yourself as we give. With the measure we use, it's measured unto us. Somebody's given the biggest offering they've ever given. As we give right now, in faith, trusting and believing that something is about to happen for us. We trust you. We trust you. 
In Jesus' name. We all said together, amen. God bless you as you give. So glad that you're able to be with us this morning. Hallelujah. Listen, we need to hear. I already know there's going to be testimonies from this service. Testimonies. Because I'm prophesying. Dead bones live. I'm talking to skin and bones. Some of us feel like, yeah, we're down to skin and bones. But God can resurrect the skin and bones and turn us into a vast army. That's my prayer. That we'll be full of his presence. So glad you were with us this morning. Now listen, we're going to have service again at 1130. It's in about 30, 40 minutes. And so you can share. You can come back with us at 1130. We'll be right here. Worship team, I'm going to share this word with you again. Wednesday night, you don't want to miss it. I got a word for you this Wednesday night. You want to be here tuned in live with us. I've been doing something different where I've been. We've been having live worship, but then I've just been doing a devotional teaching just from my study. And so many folk have been watching and loving that. And uh, so let somebody know and share. It's easier than ever for you to share your faith and get somebody else to see and know that God is moving Come on, let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you. Thank you for our time today. Thank you for your word that is working in us and through us. Now, God, we pray that your glory would be revealed in us. God, we pray that your power would fall on us. God, we pray that you would bless us this week. Here we are, Lord God, this week as we enter the last, the, the end of this month and rolling into August. God, I pray your power your anointing, your grace on us. Have your way in us. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done in us right now. Bring us back together on Wednesday night. In Jesus' name we pray. We all sit together. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. See you at 1130. See you Wednesday night. God bless you.